everyone. Um, I appreciate it is bang on the dot of six o'clock, but because we have such a um, full program, um, we're going to start the webinar now. It is, of course, being recorded. So um, for those of you that may be joining um, a couple of minutes late, it's not a problem because you will be able to um, catch up with us as well. So thank you, first of all, for joining us this evening. I hope the weather is better with you than it is in the UK right now. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules. This webinar is being recorded. The recording will be available on um, FH Europe Foundation's YouTube channel. And we'd appreciate it if you use the chat box for saying hello and submitting your questions uh, to the Q&A. Okay. And um, because we have patients um, on this as well. If you have any questions, um, please can you make them general um, as opposed to um, specific? We'd much appreciate that. Okay, and so um, we'll begin. Thank you for joining us this evening on our, our webinar about the misdiagnosis and gender bias in women with um, familial hypercholesterolemia. And this is in honour of the FH Awareness Day, which, of course, takes place on Sunday. So um, I'd like to start off, um, first of all, by opening up a poll uh, to the audience. There are four poll questions um, that I'd like to, you to answer, if you don't mind. And this will form the basis um, of the topic of, uh, of conversation uh, for the next 45 minutes or so and then there'll be plenty of time for the audience um, yourselves to um, answer questions ask questions etc and then um, once the poll's ended we'll then go on and um, introduce our amazing uh, female panelists that we have joining us this evening okay I'll just give it a few more moments for poll questions. To be answered. Okay. Right. I'll leave it um, another 20 seconds or so. And then I'll go on and introduce our amazing panel. Okay. Lovely. Great. So we have an amazing, um, amazing bunch of um, female panelists this evening. And I'd first like to start by introducing um, Professor um, Kirsten Holven from Norway. Kirsten, if you would like to um, introduce yourself and also um, uh, mention your, your expertise uh, when it comes to uh, women misdiagnosis and, uh, and FH, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, and thanks for inviting me to this panel. So my name is Kirsten Holven, and I'm a professor at the University of Oslo, Department of Nutrition. I'm also affiliated to the National Advisory Unit on FH. And I've been working with research relating to patients with FH for more than 25 years, with particular focus on impact on cholesterol exposure in children with FH and then women's health issue, focusing especially on women with FH pregnancy and breastfeeding and lives through life and so forth. I also work very closely with the patient organization, both the European FH Europe, but also our local FH Norway patient organization. So I participate in annual meet member meetings where we meet and interact with the patients. Uh, and these interactions are extremely useful, not only for the patients because they get to ask a lot of questions, but also for me, uh, because we get an understanding of the concern that many patients have and also through these interactions, we become aware of the, 
and can identify research areas that are really understudied it's because we cannot answer all the questions and then we just need to find these questions. So this is really highly motivating for me as a researcher. Can't believe I did it. I put myself on mute. Um, thank you, Kirsty. And um, that that was a great introduction and um, really interesting to hear the the work that you're doing um, in Norway in Oslo. And um, you, you've had so many years of experience as well, going on for for twenty five now. It's uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. And uh, I'd now like to introduce you to. Um, Caroline um, Verhach from um, Women Heart, uh, sorry, Brown Heart um, in the Netherlands. Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for inviting me for this meeting. My name is, if you pronounce it right, Caroline Verhage, and I'm the founder and the chairman of uh, Brown Heart Foundation in the Netherlands. I became a heart patient at the age at uh, 52. And before that, I had a really nice life, beautiful kids, nice social life, good jobs. And then all of a sudden, I started having issues with my health. Uh, and I visited several doctors and asked them what was wrong with me. And the response that I had, well, it's nothing to do with your health. Um, uh, it, it's probably something you've got to take a rest um, and all the signs that I had, like extreme fatigue and pain between my shoulder blades and stomach ache, didn't ring a bell with them. Uh, neither did that in my uh, surroundings. So nobody said, nobody knew what was going on. Uh, this unfortunately uh, resulted in a heart attack uh, when I was in the gym. Uh, and then finally, I knew it was my heart. Unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of damage and subsequently I had to undergo open heart surgery. And um, in the whole process, I searched online for answers to the question, why me? Because I was healthy, sportive and only 52. And then I found out that heart problems with women present differently than with men. And I decided to share all the information that I found on a website called frauenhart.nl. Then I started a Facebook group uh, to get in touch with fellow sufferers. And much to my surprise, there were hundreds of them, all similar stories, not recognized symptoms, taking long before getting a diagnose. And now we have about 12,000 women in the the Netherlands that uh, follow uh, Frauenhart. Um, in our foundation, we work with a team together with patients, doctors, and researchers advocating for a woman's uh, heart health. And we want to make sure that everybody knows the symptoms of heart disease, uh, that they present different in women than in men. Uh, like I said, extreme fatigue, stomach ache, the pain between the shoulder blades, shortness of breath, nausea, fever, sweating, uh, feeling restless. They can all be uh, symptoms of heart problems. So it's thank you for inviting me so I can tell this, share this with the audience. Thank you very much, Carolina. Um, I think we're going to have an absolutely fantastic discussion because we've all got so many different stories and backgrounds to share. I'd like to introduce you next to um, Cheryl um, Lika. And um, yes, the floor is over to you now, Cheryl. Thank you, Emma. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Cheryl, and I'm from Lebanon. And I have to say I'm honored to be among these powerful panelists. Um, so my journey with HOFH has been a lifelong adventure, uh, as I might say. Um, I was diagnosed with HOFH at a young age, and that diagnosis set me on a path that has shaped my life in profound ways. Um, from the early days of my diagnosis, I've been on a roller coaster of treatments and challenges that come with this rare uh, genetic condition. And three years ago, I became an HOFH patient ambassador with FH Europe Foundation. 
Um, it was a turning point for me as I was determined to seek more information about this disease and raise awareness and advocate for my fellow patients uh, worldwide. And throughout my medical encounters, I've had healthcare providers tell me that my hormones were somehow protecting me from my disease. And sometimes what I was feeling or experiencing was attributed to stress and lifestyle choices without even considering that I am first and foremost an HFH patient. So tonight, as we come together for this discussion, um, my hope is to emphasize the critical importance of challenging misdiagnosis and gender bias within the healthcare system. Thank you very much, Sherelle. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to um, Dr. Julia Brantz uh, from Germany. Over to you. <laughs> thank you, Emma. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure for me to contribute to this webinar and I'm really looking forward to the, to the interesting discussions. So I myself am a cardiologist in training based in Germany and Aachen especially. And I'm working um, quite early in, in my training. I started working in a lipid clinic where um, I learned the beauty of lowering cardiovascular risk. So the risk for heart attacks or some kind of these events through lipid lowering therapy. And I think a bit in contrast to most of my cardiologists uh, colleagues who are really love the rush and the emergency and love to do the catheter lab i'm more on the on the quiet side i love to um, work on prevention and this is also where then i took my research i started to study um, lipid disorders in patients with diabetes and took it further went to uh, london to work with professor koshik ray and his working group who are um, leading the global uh, familiar hypercholesterolemia registry. And um, from then on, I focused much more on um, familiar hypercholesterolemia, but stayed within the work of cardiovascular disease prevention. And so I would say I'm, I'm on both sides of the problem. I will definitely have done some misdiagnosis myself I think you can never be free of this, but I'm working hard and I'm listening to to the people on the panel, what we as the physicians could have done differently. So I'm grateful to be here. And Julia, thank you very much. And thank you for your honesty um, as well. I know as as patients, we, we really, really appreciate that. And, um, and I think, as I said, we are going to have a, a fantastic discussion. But before that, I'd just like to introduce you to um, our last amazing panelist, um, Elsie Evans, um, who is also um, a patient with us, as well as a strong female individual as well. <laughs> um, hi, uh, my name is Elsie. Um, I'm also known as Cindy to some, um, uh, something I can blame on my brothers and I'll explain another time maybe. Um, I've worked in education for 20 odd years uh, with a focus on special education needs, neurodiversity and technology in education. Um, I became involved with FH Europe uh, a few years ago as a patient ambassador sharing my story um, and I'm now supporting with uh, uh, the kind of ambassador program to, to kind of share some knowledge and education as well. Um, I've lived in the UK for 23 years, but originally I'm from South Africa. Uh, I love to travel, I spend time in nature, I love crafts with other people, uh, but I also live with a rare condition, homozygous FH. Uh, a bit like Sherelle, I was diagnosed when I was three and a half. Slightly misdiagnosis in the fact that the doctor thought it was a uh, wart that he tried to remove. Uh, it was a xanthoma, so it didn't quite work. Uh, on the positive, though, he... He did hear a story or he read something that this uh, might be high cholesterol and kind of pointed me in the right direction um, and sent me to a specialist. Uh, as you can imagine, I was three, so I don't really know what happened, all of those things. But I do know that my mum had some really difficult conversations, um, a bit of bias because of the condition. Uh, she was told that I wouldn't see 11. Uh, so she had to deal with a lot of stuff when it came to that. And because she was woman and she was mum, 
Uh, she was seen as being too feisty and too argumentative and whatever. But uh, I was very blessed in the fact that she, you know, she did this for us. I had my first heart attack when I was 21. Um, I had a second heart attack a few years later. I have a variety of stents uh, from different decades, which is uh, interesting. Um, but the main thing is that I've joined the panel to kind of have a look at how people are treated with HFH, because sometimes um, even when they know what the condition is, they sweep it aside because if there's nothing they can do about it. These days, there's a lot more that they can do about it. Um, and hopefully part of this panel will be able to show them that there is something different and not just to take things at face value, but to look at the person. Thank you, Elsie. Um, it's really, really good to hear, hear your your story as well, uh, your perspective and um, and what, what you can hope to learn as well and what we can contribute this evening. I, I think, um, as I keep saying, I think it would be good. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. Um, my name's Emma. I'm a um, FH and LP little a patient. Uh, I did have a misdiagnosed, well, I, I didn't get diagnosed at all. I found out I had high cholesterol when I was 23. Uh, when I was in Italy, um, my doctors at the time in the UK um, said I was young, fit, healthy. My estrogen levels would protect me. Um, so not to worry about it. 10 years later, my mother passed away from a heart attack. So maybe if I'd been diagnosed that, you know, she could win on medication and uh, that may not have happened. Anyway, um, we're running this um, uh, webinar as more of a group discussion um, this evening, as opposed to lots of PowerPoints, hence the poll questions. So um, without further ado, the first poll question was a true or false. And um, women having a heart attack delay seeking medical help longer than men because they don't recognize these symptoms. Now, 91% of our wonderful audience um, thought that was true. So this is going to be um, our first topic of discussion um, within our panel. So ladies, over to you. Why, um, why do women delay um, seeking medical help longer than men, do we think, um, when, when they're having a heart attack, appreciate the symptoms are incredibly different. And I also think there's a lot of discussion around, maybe it's maybe it's our age, maybe because we're tired, maybe because we're stressed. And I think as women, we do tend to think about those possibilities first before um, looking at the fact that it may be something potentially a lot more harmful, of course. So if I may start, I think referring back to my textbook knowledge about myocardial infarction, which is basically a heart attack, I think one of the reasons is we are indoctrinated with this thought that uh, what we call, so in, in cardiology terms, we call the, the chest pain, we call it the angina. And we, we differentiate between the typical angina and the atypical angina and the typical symptoms and the atypical symptoms. And the typical symptoms is like the this pressure on your chest, shortness of breath, but um, and then having the pain in the neck or in the jawline. But this is, and this is what we refer to as typical, but this is only what it's typical for men to experience a heart attack. For women, this is not the typical um, presence of, of this or the signs of a heart attack, but it's much more, as uh, Caroline also already told us, it's much more often it's nausea, it's it's the stomach ache, it's, um, it's backache. So I think it really starts with with how we are with our health literacy, what we know, not only as doctors, but also in the lay public, what we learn about what is a heart attack and what not. So I think that is one of the problems. Maybe the others can contribute. With their... Something I found when I had my heart attack was they they looked at this person. Um, I had had uh, I'd gone for aqua aerobics the night before. So their first answer was that 
Uh, first of all, I delayed going. Then it was, oh, you must have just pulled something. Maybe you've pulled a muscle when you were doing the exercise. And I was very lucky in the fact that there was a really good nurse who looked at this and went, something's not quite right, and really pushed it. And then once they gave me the medication and whatever, you know, it was much better. But the sad bit was that even in A&E, the doctors didn't understand the condition HOFH. They kind of went, oh, you've got high cholesterol, but it's not that bad. So. I agree. And <clears throat> I don't necessarily think that it's it's not that the women don't um, go to the doctor. But when they present the symptoms, it is not recognized as as, uh, as a heart attack. So we also wrote a case report. We really fits very well with what you say, Emma, because it was a she was a young uh, woman, very physically fit, but she started she started having being tired when she did exercise. And so she was diagnosed with asthma first and got on asthma medication. And then she had some burning uh, um, burning pain in the in the upper chest. And then she was uh, she was diagnosed with some gastro problems that giving, you know, um, acid neutralizing <laughs> agents. But of course, uh, uh, some weeks later, she fainted while doing the exercise and then she was taken to hospital. But still then she was not admitted to hospital. But referred back home because most likely it was just, as you say, just exhaustion based on some other uh, issues. But she actually had a heart attack. So it was, luckily, she she went to the hospital herself and then she was diagnosed uh, and she had an acute um, acute coronary bypass. But but she was 30, so the doctor just didn't, they didn't recognize the symptoms and also they didn't recognize a young woman could have a heart attack. So I think it's, uh, it's as you say in the textbook, it's an education for the for the doctors, we need to educate the doctors to recognize these symptoms, and maybe also uh, the women that, because we are also told that the typical symptoms are the chest, um, uh, the chest pain and the left, uh, the left hand pain. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I I agree. I think um, I think edu education amongst our healthcare um, professionals is is very very important, but also education amongst ourselves as women. To, um, to actually listen to our own bodies and make, make, maintain that, that conviction that we have when we know something isn't correct and re-educate ourselves about what the signs of a heart attack um, actually are and disseminate that information and spread that um, amongst our, our friends, our families, our compatriots and... Um, get that information out there as um, easily and efficiently as we can. I think I think the summary for, for this poll is that um, this particular poll question is that education um, is key and the more we can do that, hopefully the more lives we can we can save. Um, ladies, has anyone else got anything you'd like to add to this particular poll question? Yeah, maybe I can say something. Um, oh. I I think uh, that women take their time before they go to the doctor because always they uh, find their children or their husband or their work or the or their father or mother. They find that more important. So they wait a long time before they visit the doctor. And then we also see that uh, in our groups that women that do visit the doctors um, and they don't know uh, uh, what the what the symptoms are for heart problems. Uh, they get sent away. And if you get sent away once or twice or three times, you think, I'm not going to go again because I'm, there's nothing wrong uh, with me. And uh, I think that's a very large problem. And I think really that people should listen to their instinct. Uh, and that's a really important thing. Yeah, I agree. I think that we, the women, are, we we don't recognize the severity of the symptoms because we go to the doctor feeling a little tired, and and then the doctor says, "Well, well, it's just have you worked hard." And I mean, they don't. So then we go, then we are sort of uh, confirmed that this is not so serious. So maybe it's just you know feeling tired. So so I think yeah, we we don't recognize ourselves the severity of the symptoms because they're not so good described for women. Yeah, I think that's right as well, because the symptoms can be so varied and can be associated with so many other illnesses, tiredness, menopause, etc. Um, we always put those those concerns first and think it might might be something completely different. So, yeah, it is having that, that conviction and knowing exactly what what these symptoms are. Um, 
Panelists, if it's okay with you, I'll move on to the um, next poll question. With me. So the next poll question is, um, a woman is 50% more likely to receive the wrong diagnosis initially after a heart attack um, than a man. And again, that was a true or false um, question. I'm just trying to bring up the answers. Here we go. And 100% of our fantastic audience um, thought that was true. So ladies, open over to you for um, the discussion. A woman is 50% more likely to receive a wrong diagnosis um, initially after a heart attack um, than our, our male friends and family. Um, yes. who would I think we covered a little already because I mean, as, as we talked about, they're not recognized uh, these uh, symptoms. So uh, as both the two patients already they told us that they were not also diagnosed immediately and yourself also is an estrogen is protected so it's no and uh, the case that I told about was diagnosed with asthma and uh, or, or, or gastrointestinal problems where it really was a heart attack so so I agree I think it's uh, it's still so that um, doctors think that young women or women <laughs> they don't get heart attacks so it's sort of it's not in their in, in, in their minds to think about that diagnosis. It, it, it's um, Sherelle mentioned it earlier that also we are told quite often that our hormones will protect us. Um, and I know, Kirsten, you did some work on the fact that actually the, the timelines for women are different um, and not always recognize that uh, that it still has an impact. Mm. Yeah, so uh, but uh, we don't know really so much about these uh, women specific um, uh, transition periods, if I can call it like that, the menstrual cycle. The pregnancy, breastfeeding, and also menopause. Uh, so we know that in the uh, during the menstrual cycle there is a variation in uh, in cholesterol, uh, which is not um, the variation is not so big in 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 women in healthy women if I can use that word. But if you look, if we had an example for women with FH where there really was a huge variation just from uh, the start of the menstruation to the ovulation uh, around one millimolar. So it really matters if. If if the doctor is not aware of these variation in in during the during the period, uh, because that can sort of uh, lead to under treatment of the women because and and then the fact was just that the blood sample was taken at two different times in the in the menstrual cycle. But this is something that we know very little about, especially among women with FH. We don't know the impact of estrogen or these yeah in and this transition period on on later risk. Mm. So, Kirsten, would you suggest that a lot more research needs to be done on this in the future? And um, I guess we need to find an appropriate way to to carry out this research and get more women involved in in research so we can get stop collecting yeah. some results. Because I think one problem is that in the majority of studies, especially these intervention studies, the majority of participants are always male. So therefore, all the results are always based <laughs> primarily on male uh, results. And then it's just sort of adjusted and down adjusted. And then it's similar for women. It's assumed that the effect is similar to women. But women have a completely different biology. And then it's never taken into account these specific women, specific periods, because, I mean, they don't, I mean, we don't have them in the male. So therefore, very little research has also been concentrated on these periods, I think. So, so we need more women also to participate both as researchers, but also in research. Because I think also women, we are more, uh, that's also what I like when I talk to the patients, because what are their concerns? And then I try to answer, and then I realize, well, we actually don't know so much about this. So we have to find out more about it. So so it's very it's very beneficial for us to talk directly to the patients to to sort of find out what where there is uh, not, where more knowledge is needed. Kristen, is there a way you think that we can encourage more women to participate in research um, surveys and generally be more involved in this process so we can gather more information um, how, how this impacts us as, as women? Yeah, so I think that if, I mean, if, if we think about what, I, what is that you would like to know more about, and then, I mean, we are trying to get these answers and we can only get these answers by getting your uh, participation in the projects. 
So, uh, so it will it, it will eventually benefit you to participate in 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 in, in the research of different projects. So, mm. brilliant. Thank you. Um, would mm. would anyone else like to uh, to add anything? Yeah, I wanted to say that um, uh, after I had my heart attack, it took a, a even longer to get the right diagnosis because. Um, in the hospital they didn't they knew that i had a heart attack but they didn't know where it came from uh, and then it took a long time before i got the proper diagnose and we find that women in uh, our groups uh, are saying that the time um, before they really get a diagnose is two and a half years so that's really very very long wow yeah, two, two and a half years is is far too long, but I I imagine that's unfortunately common. Um, yes, for me, obviously, it took a lot longer. And um, Cheryl, how how what do you think, and how long did it it take you for diagnosis? And what are your thoughts about involving um, women in um, research uh, uh, such as this to share their experiences? Uh, yeah, I mean, I wanted to add um, to what uh, Professor Kirsten said, like more research about women because many public um, um, campaigns are based on symptoms on men. And I think it's very important and hopefully in the future with more research, um, we can create some kind of guidelines or protocols that consider gender-related differences in cardiovascular health and diagnosis. And um, because sometimes healthcare providers mistakenly uh, link women's health or symptoms to non-heart related problems or because women as a, as a um, young woman instead of so it's age related or gender related so if we have some kind of guidelines it would be much easier to get diagnosed faster and get treated faster so we can avoid um, severe consequences hmm. So maybe that could be a, a future call to action to create these guidelines um, in order to support and, and protect women um, in the future and get the treatment on time. On the other side. Yeah. Good. Um, Julia, is there anything you'd like to add at all? Oh, <clears throat> I think um, we had this question in the, in the chat. So... How do we get more women to to participate in these trials? I think, um, and uh, Shirelle very very nicely pointed out we have to uh, also look at our trial design and how they are designed. And then let's go back to who is designing the trials. I mean, at least I know the numbers in Germany. There is no one leading in cardiology that is female. So I think we we have to tackle this from both sides. So those people who are doing it, I think we should see some more women there. And again, we as women and as patients, we have to, I think, be extra active and show a lot of initiative to look for opportunities to participate. I yeah. think, we, yeah, we have to make an extra effort. Yeah, self-advocacy. Mm. I always yeah. think that the, to also to look at what is important for the patients to know more about. So involve the patients when we when we look at what are we what are the knowledge gaps what are, what is it that we want to research on because uh, really it's it's the patient that often have both the answers and the questions so so I think to to look at the more patients related outcomes because we are very clever to look at cholesterol and risk but there are also other um, other sites in life uh, life quality that sometimes get pushed in the back. And which is really maybe it's more important for the patient at a certain time. So so we have to look at that and maybe by knowing more about that, then we can also, uh, it's easier to follow, like uh, uh, take the medication and things like that. We need to look at the bigger picture, I think. Uh, and to, yeah. That is... Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's It does come down to, not come down to, but including looking at the bigger picture as well. And um, I believe, um, Kirsten, in a study you mentioned earlier about the um, young girl um, who had had the heart attack, at one point she wasn't taking her medication for a while. So it's it's what can can we do um, as as healthcare professionals and as patients to make sure that 
you know, the medicine is taken, whatever that may be, whether it's statins, et cetera, how can we ensure that we as individuals take it and how as healthcare professionals can you support patients in ensuring um, that they're getting the best best possible treatment and the outcome for um, for the for FH HOFH? I think I think compliance is important, but I think it's also important for people to realise that sometimes when something goes wrong, just a, a comment that quite often comes back as a flippant comment going, "Oh, you had a good holiday," or "Oh, you didn't take it all again this time," you know that type of thing doesn't help women then want to come forward and have that conversation because they feel they're automatically going to be blamed for it when uh, when it might be something different. Wow. Elsie, that's a really good point. And to be honest, even as a patient, that's one I hadn't considered before. So um, so thank you for, for sharing that, that insight. That's really useful. And uh, Carolina, from um, your perspective and uh, for our heart, um, what, what's your impression and um, perspective um, on this? Well, I must say that, um, uh, that there's a change going on here in the Netherlands uh, because there are a lot of young researchers, which are mostly uh, or a lot of uh, female uh, researchers, and they're very uh, keen on um, uh, bringing gender differences into their studies. Um, so I'm very pleased uh, with that. And um, I think that... Um, it all starts with education because I'm really sure that when I was in the hospital, when I visited the doctors, uh, they were not doing me wrong, but they just didn't know. I mean, in my surroundings, nobody ever said, is it your heart? So I think it's very important to have education. And then in the combination with the young researcher, um, it's very important. And as Stichting Vrouwenhart, we have a lot of women which we encourage to participate in the study because I feel that we learn a lot from one another and the researcher cannot do his work without the patient participating. Uh, so it's a sort of, um, yeah, a coalition that you make uh, to get information out in the world. Yeah, that's such a good point as well. And and within your organisation as well, it's. <clears throat> and and into organizations it's having that peer support as well as as a sort of um the healthcare professional patient relationship it's how we as women can support each other no matter what our, our position our expertise our story our role it's coming together uniting and learning from each other and and our own experiences yeah it, we find that I'm oh, sorry, I wish mm -hmm. that there's a lot of knowledge in these groups, because if we are with a lot of patients that have the same um, uh, conditions, they can learn so much from one another. And then when we uh, get these uh, researchers also learning, uh, that is very important that we learn from one another. Very much. Okay, um, I think... Julia, May I jump in? So because of course you can, absolutely. Part of the, the topic of compliance, and I think compliance to medication is also very difficult, especially for, for young women suffering from FH, maybe not yet having any, any um, clinical effects from it. So not yet having, fortunately, not yet having suffered from a heart attack. So up until then, it is a condition that does not hurt, but you then have to take your medication. And this is a bit obscure when we look at the social media and everything that is surrounding us, which is always promoting like this healthy lifestyle, detox, don't use any chemicals, don't put it in your body. So I think this is also very contradicting to these people. They say, okay, but if I just train hard and if I just have a good diet, I will, I, I can overcome the effects of my high cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is double unfair to these women all this promotion that we have going around and then on top of it something that not only women struggle from is the bad reputation of statins so if they go to their family at least one people in the family will say to them oh no statins aren't good didn't you hear they are harmful so and we we have to get much much better in the education part here and have to reach a much broader 
um, audience. So not only these already affected, but it. if we talk about prevention, it's always an unsexy topic because you can never see it if it really works. So, but we have to be much louder, I guess. It is absolutely, because I think there's a big thing if people, yeah, you've got high cholesterol, there is a, a mountain of old wives' tales. And if you just take this, it'll help, or, you know, uh, black onion seeds or, you know, and, and that's great. But if it's a genetic condition, you can have all of that. It's not going to make a difference. And as you say, because it's a it's almost a silent condition, you know, you don't know that it's going to go wrong until it goes wrong. Um, and be because you don't feel it, 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 you don't have that drive as a woman because there's always something else. You know, there's there's family, there's work, there's development, there's, and uh, if you don't feel poorly, then why would you make a change in it? Um, and unfortunately, I think that's a lot of people kind of work that way. It's the the carrot and stick. So it's the, you know, what can we do to change, to change people's view on it and to be able to take away those the issues for them to be able to engage and get involved in it without the stigma that goes with it. Mm. There is a lot of stigma um, around medication, you're right, and also lifestyle and high cholesterol and how it impacts um, us as women. And uh, medication, particularly as you mentioned, um, Julia, with the statins. And Shirelle, um, how is it for you over in Lebanon at the moment with medication? Is there a shortage at all? Is it okay? There is. Yeah, it's very difficult now to access treatment, the life-saving treatment called the Adele Ephesus. And this is my issue right now. And the thing about um, dismissing what you're experiencing, as I recently had some sensations and felt pressure on my chest area. And I reached out to one of my physicians because I was afraid that the lack of access to treatment could lead to something more serious because I am aware I've done my research I know that if you do not treat your uh, cholesterol levels it can lead to something serious so unfortunately my concerns were dismissed instead I was told that my symptoms were attributed to stress etc and I was advised to rest and engage in stress relief activities so the lack of access to treatment can also increase anxiety can also increase symptoms and I don't know maybe fearing for your life as well. And I think patient organization and yeah, gaslighting women with symptoms, as Magdalena said in the chat, this is what happened to me. And I felt like, oh no, it's, it is stress. But I had to make sure that what I'm experiencing is not something serious and then I can take care of my stress. So I had to advocate for myself. I had to take matters into my own hands and seek another opinion from another physician that I will now tomorrow I have actually a diagnostic test I have an echo so hopefully things will go right and yeah I think it's crucial that we undergo proper diagnosis before um, arriving to any conclusions yeah, yeah. thank you Cheryl and um, absolutely well said and I hope your your echo tomorrow is um, is positive as in yeah it's it yeah, alleviates your worries and, and and your concerns yeah and if it's not we'll take care of it yeah. there's no issues <laughs> exactly it's it's having that that resilience as well but being able to reduce the anxiety and and the stress will hopefully contribute to um you know to helping you feel better yeah. in, in that respect yeah brilliant Okay, um, I'm mindful of time as well. So I am going to move on to the next poll questions and um, I'm going to answer, read and answer the poll questions three and four together so that we can um, move on to these answers and have this as a chat because they do link together. Um, so question three was, is a cholesterol, is cholesterol a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, CVD? And um, fortunately, 100% of our um, audience said yes, which is good. And um, also question number four, women with FH receive less intensive lipid lowering therapy um, than men. And 100% of um, our audience uh, agreed with this as well 
Yeah, I can go. I'm I'm very happy <laughs> that hundred percent answer that cholesterol is very important for 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 cardiovascular disease because it's really the main risk factor and it's just as important for women as for men. As Elsie was uh, talking about uh, or some of the other with the estrogen, but uh, uh, cholesterol is as important in women as for men for as a risk factor. And um, and uh, when we look at the life course of uh, cholesterol, uh, it is actually um, the women, they have higher cholesterol throughout the whole childhood and uh, adolescence up to 20 years. And then women have higher cholesterol after menopause. So it's actually only in the in the how do you say the middle period from 20 to 50 years that men have higher cholesterol. But it's always assumed. I mean, everybody say, oh, men have higher cholesterol than women, because this is the period where you normally measure your cholesterol. But actually, it's uh, I mean, there are large periods both um, in the in the childhood and after menopause where women have higher cholesterol. So now that we know that this whole uh, cholesterol burden, I mean, how much cholesterol you have been exposed to throughout life is important. Then we also need to think about these periods uh, where women have higher cholesterol. So yeah, cholesterol is important. Mm. Am I am I also correct in saying because there's the bigger or the longer exposure uh, when you're a child, then obviously when you start family planning and and you have children, you come off the medication, mm -hmm. so you then have an impact there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and if you've not treated it before you even get there, then uh, that has a, a knock on effect. That is a very good point that we uh, we looked at that in the survey because um, uh, where we because. That is also a question from the from the patients. We didn't know how long time do women really have these off statin periods. I mean, because of pregnancy and breastfeeding, and we found that it was in general around two point three years or something. But you know, there was such a huge variation. But there were some women had fourteen years without treatment because they had maybe three children and then the breastfed for a long time, and then they didn't start you know the treatment in between. So I agree. I think that these uh, has been underestimated. These long periods uh, where women go without treatment because of so um so this is also something that should be taken into consideration when you talk about i mean um, the cholesterol lowering the target maybe women especially with fh maybe they should have a lower target uh, in the i mean when they start treatment as a child and in the young age because then they can compensate for knowing that later you will have some periods where you are without statin uh, and then of course we we know too little about the impact of statin really both in pregnancy and in breastfeeding as of the moment it's not recommended because but really the knowledge is really very limited uh, on, on the effect of statin in these periods but uh, but i agree these um, pregnancy and breastfeeding periods we, we know um, that women they are off statin in these periods and they have they will uh, lead to higher uh, exposure of cholesterol mm -hmm. So, Kirsten, to clarify, if um, if women who are, for example, diagnosed with um, FH at a young age, if their um, their statin level, their medication, um, if they have a, a lower target to reach by the time they reach um, adulthood and um, pregnancy, mm. that will protect them a little bit more, so that their less levels won't rise as high when they're off a medication during pregnancy, breastfeeding? Uh, they, will, they, they will get the high cholesterol also in pregnancy, but because, I mean, it's if, it, if you look at it like a glass that is filled with cholesterol, so if you sort of have uh, closed the tap a little in, in, the, in, the, in the young age, mm -hmm. and then you can have the tap running while you're pregnant because it's still not as full as the one that uh, has it more, the tap is running faster, if you understand what I mean. So I think that, uh, yeah, to, to think about how we can sort of compensate for, for these periods. Because in, in women with FH, we see that the young women uh, at the age of 30, they have higher cholesterol exposure than young men. And it is because of these pregnancy-related uh, uh, statin free periods. So I think that you can do something to compensate in, in, in advance uh, by having a little lower uh, LDL target. Mm. And in, in relation to that, for our audience, um, if anyone is interested, um, Kirsten has actually um, written a survey, um, which we'll now put in the chat box, which provides you with a link to fill in. And it's about 
um, women with um, FH and um, pre and during and, and postpartum as well. So the more people, the more women, of course, we can get to um, complete this survey from their own experiences, it would be very helpful. Um, here's a QR code um, for you to uh, click on, and we should be sending the link as well. And uh, that will help with um, research gathering and information. So it will at least be one area that we can, um, you know, bring some more focus yeah. to very yeah. much. And in this survey, we are asking a lot of the same questions that we are discussing now to get information about what is it really among, how is it really, how long periods are uh, women without statin and uh, so, uh, so please, it's translated into, I think, 15, 16 languages. So please uh, fill it out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so 16 languages. So hopefully it will be available for, um, for the majority of people who would like to fill it in. Thank you. OK. And uh, Julia, have you got anything to um, add? I'm, I'm sure, sure you have with your, your expertise and your thoughts. Well, um, I mean, the cholesterol exposure, yeah, I completely, of course, I completely agree with Kirsten. So, I mean, that's the issue. We have two, two, two things to consider when we talk about LDL cholesterol lo levels. That is the LDL cholesterol level itself, and then its timing. How long does the LDL circulate over our lifetime? So... And I love the picture you uh, you gave us, Kirsten, with the glass because yeah, in, exactly. We can never get the cholesterol out of the glass again if it's one time it's in, it's in the vessel, it got defect, uh, affected. So, no, not really anything to add. <laughs> and again, from Kirsten, from a patient perspective, your image of the glass that really helped me as well to uh, to visualize it. So, so thank you for that. Uh, Carolina and Sherelle, is there anything you'd like to? Have you got any thoughts on the? On this this topic of cholesterol or or um, FH, everything was explained perfectly. Thank you, Carolina. Um, maybe with heart patients, there's also always the discussion: should I take the statins or not? And I find uh, very often it's uh, following protocol. And I think um, if you have a cholesterol of three. Uh, maybe it's not necessary to take the cholesterol, but maybe the doctors know more about it. But if you're a high uh, cholesterol, it's really uh, useful. So I think that maybe uh, instead of, oh, you're a heart patient, you got to take cholesterol. There should be more information about uh, do you really need it instead of uh, giving it uh, because of the protocol. Yeah, but if I may jump in here, I completely, I, I understand your concern, Caroline. However, the reality we're currently dealing with is exactly different. So we, when we look at current studies, looking at, so the first thing you have to consider if you want to treat LDL cholesterol is the baseline risk of the patient. So how high is his chance to get a heart attack, for example, within the next 10 years? Optimally, we would look at lifetime risk, but tools to assess this are, are quite poor currently. But so, and if you are a heart patient, you're already within the very high risk group. And then we know that we can almost use LDL cholesterol like your volume regulator for risk. So even if you have quite a low LDL in the beginning, you will benefit from uh, reducing the LDL cholesterol, no matter what. This is this is because it is causal. This is, um, and yes, I agree with you. If your risk is not that high, but then you're not a heart patient. So if you're not, if you're or a, a, a cardiovascular disease patient, so then I would agree. But the others, and I mean, not not necessarily. Currently, standard eye therapy is a statin because it's cheap we have the most experience with statins there are more than 25 trials that have shown it's beneficial and it's safe it's the best study drug we have compared to any drug and so i think we we, we really have to work on 
on the reputation of statins and lipid lowering therapy. And most often if a doctor recommends it, it it's actually beneficial. Thank you, Julia. But, but please tell me if I'm if I'm wrong here or if you disagree or if I'm no. if I didn't no. realize the problem or didn't get the problem correctly. I, I understand where Carolina is coming from is that precision medication that is more specific for that person and making it more tailored. Um, I also understand from the other point of view that that is difficult because there isn't the, the, the difference uh, available. I think sometimes statins do get a bad rap and, and there are lots of studies that have shown that they, they're appropriate for what we need. Um, I think some patients uh, from, from talking to them, the issue they've had in the past is if they um, have side effects uh, you know, or they feel they have side effects, they get kind of swept to aside rather than trying a different statin because in their practice, they only have this one or they only have that one. So I, I get we have to change what statins are thought of, but I think we also need to um, take into consideration what the patient is saying, how they are feeling. And okay. sometimes if they can change to a different type, sometimes that's enough to alleviate that. Yeah. I agree. And I also just thought, I mean, we talked about a little earlier the bad, the bad uh, reputations, which is really not um, deserved because, as uh, Julia said, the statins are really some of the most the safe the medication we have. But there was a study by uh, um, Bergen Waterscore in Denmark in this group that showed that they, where they looked at the bad newspaper um, uh, ads on statin, I mean, headlines with the, how bad and, and dangerous statin were, led to less people taking the statin. They could they could look at that uh, during the uh, prescription register. So really, all these uh, headlines in the newspapers they have a direct impact on the risk uh, in patients because they, people look at these headlines and say, oh, "I better stop my statin." So so we have to sort of we have to educate also the journalists uh, that statins are really some one of the most safe drugs that we have. And then, of course, I agree. I mean, some re some um, have uh, side effects. We, we should not uh, uh, look away from that when patients complaining. We should try different statins to really sort out, is it really a side effect or is it just because the side effects like statins is like the symptoms for heart attack for women, very, <laughs> very varied and very and, and can be linked to a lot of other, um, um, I mean, uh, conditions in a way. So it's it's really very hard to pick out the side effects for statins. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, just, I'm very aware of time and we're, we're nearly finished. So um, we don't have any immediate questions in the Q&A box. So if I, first of all, I'd like to thank our amazing panelists and may I go around to each of you and ask um, if you have one key message each that you'd like to um, give to the audience. Um, I'll work around my screen actually um if we go to uh kirsten first yeah so my key message is that we need more knowledge on especially women's specific health issues such as uh, pregnancy menstrual cycle and menopause because uh, we need that knowledge to improve uh, treatment for women thank you carolina Yes, I would say trust your instincts and make sure that you have a doctor who is familiar with gender differences and prepare very well for your consults and write down your questions and make sure that they get answered. And Shirelle? Um, I would say like um, for women to educate themselves, learn more about the topic, um, connect with people in your local community, don't hesitate to, to ask for support. And when you share your stories, like it can help others to, to understand better and to make positive change in the um, woman's overall health and especially heart health. Thank you. Elsie? Um, I think the, the whole point of early diagnosis and being able to start treatment early to keep the, the lipid low, levels low so that it doesn't impact later on is important, but also to understand the unique challenges that are faced by women in different areas of their life um, and to use it as a holistic approach, not just uh, uh, looking at something that's on paper. And Julia? I would say as a patient, be be persistent and don't get 
brushed away. Be persistent and and formulate your concern. So if you if you're worried you're suffering from a heart attack, say it because then it can really easily be or be ruled out. And but yeah, don't get brushed away from from doctors. Thank you. And for our audience, if you have any ideas of how we can um, reach out to more women to involve them in research and uh, sort of general, um, yeah, how we can just how we can engage more women, um, please add now um, to the to the chat box before we finish. Uh, that would be, yeah, brilliant and very very helpful. And um, just in the meantime. Um, in case anyone is putting anything in the chat box, I would just again like to thank uh, thank our panelists um, with their stories and their expertise, and hopefully we'll be able to reach out um, to war- more women. And I'd also like to thank um, you as our audience uh, for taking your time this evening um, to be with us and understand a little bit more. Um, this, as I said, this is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel um, late on on Monday evening. So in the meantime, I wish everyone a pleasant evening and uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your, your time. And I hope to see everyone again soon on another webinar. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.